Hi, everybody. Let me see if I can get you to where you can see me. But there we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to tell you that we are giving away a really nice cutting board today. And this was donated to us from the Construction Technology Department at OCTC to go along with our Foodborne Illness Program. So all you have to do for a chance to win is comment or ask a question um, on the post and we will enter you into a random drawing and I will announce the winner at the end of the program. So without further ado, I'm happy to welcome Kelly Bland today. She works at our local extension office as part of the nutrition education program. Thank you for joining us today, Kelly. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. So I am going to go ahead and get started. I am talking about a topic that isn't really a topic that we enjoy talking about, but this time of year especially, although it's an important topic all the whole entire year, but this time of year, especially when we have not only, you know, the main dish, but we have lots and lots of side dishes that we usually have. You know, Thanksgiving is a day of feast and thankfulness. And so we wanna make sure that we keep everyone safe, um, including our food. And so we don't want an uninvited guest of a foodborne illness or food poisoning. So what I'm going to be talking to you today about is how to keep your family safe while you all are visiting together and being thankful and feasting. So how many of you all have ever had food poisoning? You know, one in six Americans have food poisoning every year, and it takes about 128,000 of us to the hospital every year. And of that, about 3,000 deaths each year from food poisoning. And especially this time of year and in the time of year that we're living now with COVID, you know, and a lot of people think they have just had the flu and not foodborne illness because the symptoms of a foodborne illness is almost exactly the same as having a flu. Things like upset stomach, vomiting, stomach cramps, you know the rest. So being aware of um, our, our, our skills in the kitchen and being proactive against um, foodborne illness and in our food safety practices is a great way to make sure that our family stays healthy and safe during this season. So the first place that um, your battle with foodborne illness and prevention is right at the grocery store. So some things to look for and know about in the grocery store is we never want to buy or use any cans with bulges or cans with large dents, badly rusted or pitted cans, or cans that have any sign of leakage. Then we want to make sure that any packages that we buy that the wrappers aren't torn. We want to make sure that when we're at the grocery store that we're buying our cold foods last. So a tip that we have is you have a two hour window from the time you buy anything to the grocery to the time you get it at home in your refrigerator or freezer. So that's why we encourage you to pick your meats um, last and then anything from the dairy case or freezer section last. So we shop that area last so that we can make sure that that window of staying cold is very low and or very small so that we can get those foods home and back where they belong in the refrigerator or the freezer. You wanna make sure to check your eggs before you leave the grocery when you select them and make sure that there's no cracks in the eggs. And then when you're buying your freezer section food, you wanna make sure that there's no ice crystals or um, that, they, that the food is a little bit soft. Anytime there's, that there's ice crystals on food, it sh it's a sign that the food has thawed and then frozen back again. So you wanna make sure that when you're selecting your foods from the frozen food section that there's no ice crystals on them. 
And then, uh, like I just mentioned, you want to make sure that you go directly home after shopping and store the foods at once. So a good rule of thumb is wherever they had it at the grocery is where you should keep it at home. So even like your canned goods and your packaged items, if they were on the shelf, then it's okay on the shelves at home. If they were in the freezer section, you want to store it in the freezer at home. So another thing that you may not know about, many foods have a date stamped on them. So there's several different dates that we need to know about um, for food safety purposes. So there's usually a use by date and the use by date is the last date a product can be used for peak quality. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it has gone bad after that date, if it's stamped with a use by date, that's just guaranteed that it would be at its peak quality. So an example of this will be um, like your eggs. So eggs are stamped with a use by date and that date guarantees that it is a grade A egg. So your eggs, you can still use them after the use by date, but only up to 30 days. And I really wouldn't use them in a baking because um, you want your eggs to be at the highest quality for baking, but you could use them still for 30 days after to eat and whatnot. And then there's a sell by date. And the sell by date is the last date a store can sell the item. You want to make sure that you use that produce or the item um, shortly after you purchase that. Um, if not, then you want to make sure that you freeze it if you're going to be using it longer. And then the last one is the best if used by date. And that date is related to um, not related to safety. It is the last guaranteed date for the high quality or um, freshness of that item. So that's just some things to, that you may know. A lot of us get confused by those dates on those packages. Hey, Kelly, I got a quick question for you. Okay. Uh, somebody was hoping you could repeat how long um, bef the ride to get groceries home should be. Like, what's too long? Two hours. So, okay. what we recommend, and now it's starting to get cooler. I know not today. We've got a record high. But um, it's not as important um, to do this uh, in the winter months as it is as it in the summer when it gets hot. So we recommend, like, if you are somebody who maybe lives out in the country and it takes maybe 30 minutes to get to town and 30 minutes to get back home and you're going to the grocery, you may want to bring a cooler and pack any of that cold or frozen items in that cooler just to maintain their cool temperature. But you generally have a two hour window. But in the summer months, when it's warmer, we say a one hour window for that food safety. Okay, one more question for you. Sure. Uh, how long can you keep meat frozen? Um, generally, we say about six months would be a good time to eat that with that window. And that's really just for freshness and quality. You know, the longer you get um, in that frozen, the more um, opportunity you have for freezer burn and things like that. You want to make sure if you are going to be freezing meat because I don't know about you all, but I um, like to buy meat in the bigger packages and then break them up when I get home. So anytime you're going to be bringing meat home from the grocery and your plan is to freeze it, we recommend that you take it out of the packaging that it's in and place it in a freezer bag because freezer bags are thicker um, than your normal bags or wrapping it in plastic wrap and then aluminum foil. So we recommend you taking it out of the package if possible repackaging it in a freezer bag and then writing the date on it that you put it in the freezer so that you know you want to use that in about six months. Now, when you do repackage it, you want to try to get as much of the air out as possible to help prevent freezer burn and those ice crystals forming on that meat. I hope that answered the question. I think it did. Thank you very Perfect. much. Very good. Very good. I love I love teaching people about food safety because of questions like that. You know, it's not something that we normally think about. And a lot of us think, oh, if the meat, you know, smells okay, then it's still okay to use. And that's not necessarily true. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. So please, and any time, if anyone has any questions, put them below in the comments. And I'll let Lisa interrupt me at any time, because I feel like this is really a good, out of all the lessons that I teach in my classes, this is really one of my favorite lessons, because it's a lot of information that we don't know about. All right. So, speaking of food safety at home, there's four steps to food safety, and I'm going to break these down for Thanksgiving, 
but this is really food safety for all times of year. So the four steps are clean, separate, cook, and chill. So those are four things that we need to remember when we're in our kitchen. So clean, of course, we are all used to doing this now, especially with COVID. But the first thing you need to clean when you enter the kitchen is you need to make sure you clean your hands. Washing your hands is the first step to beating bacteria because bacteria and germs are everywhere. We can't see them, we can't smell them, but they are on our hands. So you wanna make sure you wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. You wanna wash the palms of your hands, in between your fingers, the backs of our hands, all the way up to our wrists. And despite what my boys think, we do want you to use soap and warm water. The, the warmer, the better to kill those germs and bacteria that are on our hands. And so I have some examples on the board or on my slide of times that you do need to make sure you wash your hands because people don't think about these things, especially with smoking or petting our dogs or cats. We don't think about um, our pets picking up stuff when they're outside with on their fur and things like that. So we wanna make sure that we wash our hands um, anytime that we're doing our day-to-day -day activities, really. So that's the first step of clean, is to make sure that our hands are clean. And the second step is we wanna make sure that all of our utensils and cutting boards and countertops are all clean as well. We wanna make sure that they're clean before and during our um, cooking process. And this is gonna be especially important for Thanksgiving dinner. So of course, the first thing we wanna clean is um, our, our utensils and countertops. We wanna make sure our countertops are clean so that our work surface is clean. Then we're gonna move on to our utensils, cutting boards, and dishes. We wanna wash our things with hot, soapy water. You can even, as an extra precaution, make a sanitizing solution of a tablespoon of bleach to a gallon of water, and you can sanitize your dishes in that just by dipping them in and taking them out after you've washed them. Um, which is a good idea for our cutting boards. You wanna make sure that you can make this sanitizing solution and spray it on your countertops and clean. Um, a bleach solution like this, if you did make it in a spray bottle, is only good for about 24 hours and then it starts to dissipate. So, you know, if you're just doing this for a day, that's a great idea is to help sanitize our countertops. And then also something that we don't think about, if you're somebody like me, I like using cloth, dish um, cloths and kitchen towels, but with those, we need to make sure that we're washing them regularly. So only use that dish cloth or that kitchen towel at that time, and then go ahead and replace that. We need to make sure because anytime something moist like that, bacteria can even grow on those dish cloths and those kitchen towels. So making sure that we're washing those in hot water as well. So then the next thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we're washing our fruits and vegetables um, before we use them. So a lot of times we think like, for example, carrots, some of us may be putting carrots in our turkey um, to help add some flavor. So a lot of times people think, well, I'm gonna be peeling that carrot. I don't need to wash it before I use it. Same with our potatoes, if we're making homemade mashed potatoes, we think I'm gonna be peeling that off. But if you think about it, every time you're taking that peeler and you're peeling, you're peeling off that dirty outside part, but then you're continuing and you're touching parts of the clean carrot now that you've peeled it. And any bacteria or dirt or anything that have been on the outside of that plant, think about carrots and potatoes are grown in the ground. So they're in that soil and they're tilled up and all. So anytime that you're doing that, any bacteria that's on there, you're now putting on that clean part and putting into your turkey or your food to be prepared for dinner. So we encourage you to wash your fruits and vegetables before you start cutting them. Even things like during our summer months, I like to always mention our watermelons and cantaloupes. We don't think about watering or washing those because that watermelon, we're just gonna cut and eat the inside. But if you think about that melon, anything that's on that outside, also pause for a minute. Think about those watermelons and cantaloupes when you're at the grocery. If you're like me, you pick it up, you might shake it, you might smell it or you know things like that. And if it's not one, I, I'm gonna put it back down. 
So my germs are now on that cantaloupe. Your germs come around, you shake it, whatever. So think about how many people have handled those cantaloupes and watermelons in the grocery. So you wanna take those home and wash them. Do you need any produce wash or soap and water or bleach? No, you do not. You just wash it in warm water. If the skin is a tough skin, we recommend that you get a produce brush and kind of brush that dirt off and give it a good scrub before you peel it. Um, and then you wanna dry your produce with a paper towel and throw that paper towel away, getting it the moisture off. Now, I do have a question. Do I wash my poultry or eggs or any of my meat before I cut that up? What do you think? So we recommend no, that you do not need to wash your meat or your turkey or chicken before you use it because you can't wash off the bacteria that's in the meat of that turkey or the chicken. And you have that opportunity every time you wash it in the water splashes off, there's an opportunity for bacteria to spread that way as well. And if you don't wipe beside your sink or something like that, that bacteria could form and bloom along that sink line and you may not know it. And then eggs are already clean prior to being in the grocery store. So anytime you do any extra handling, you do have an opportunity to cause a fracture or breakage that you may not see with your eye. But if there is any bacteria on your hands or anything, there is an opportunity for it to get inside to that egg. So we don't recommend washing your meat or your poultry or any eggs before you eat them. So moving on to cross-contamination. So I brought with me a green cutting board and a red cutting board. Why do you think I have two separate cutting boards? And this is really important, especially when we are fixing our turkey and then maybe cutting up those potatoes or carrots or onions, things like that. Why do you think I have two different cutting boards? I will give you the answer. So we have two different cutting boards. My red cutting board is for meats and my green cutting board is for my fresh fruits and vegetables. So we want to make sure that we're avoiding cross contamination while we're preparing our foods. Um, we want to make sure we have two separate cutting boards at all times and one that you automatically know is um, one for meat and one for produce. That way, no matter when I'm fixing something, I always have a meat cutting board and I always have a fresh fruits and vegetable cutting board. So you don't necessarily have to get two different cutting, cutting boards like I do. Um, but you need to make sure that you and your family know that this cutting board is designated for meats only. So that helps prevent cross contamination. Um, you also want to make sure that if your cutting board has a lot of grooves or cuts in it from use over the years, that you do replace your cutting board. Even if you are the best dishwasher on the planet, there's still an opportunity for bacteria to get down in those cuts and grooves. So anytime that our cutting boards get um, marks and nicks on them, it's a good time to go ahead and replace a cutting board. And then you wanna make sure that you use separate plates and utensils for our cooked and our raw foods. And you wanna make sure that if I am cutting something up, um, maybe I'm trimming the turkey with a little, cutting a little bit of the fat off or things like that, I don't wanna use that same knife for my fresh fruits and vegetables until I've washed it first in that hot soapy water. And this is also important, especially during the summer, although I know some barbecue masters will grill year round. Um, whatever I carry my uh, meat out on to put on the grill, you wanna make sure that you use a different plate or tray to take that cooked meat off of the grill. So you don't want to make you want to make sure you're not putting it on that same plate and you want to make sure whatever tongs you've been using to flip the meat or whatever that you do take in and wash before you take that cooked meat off the grill. Um, you want to make sure that uh, you separate your raw meat and food and eggs at the grocery store as well. So what I suggest in my classes is. I know that a lot of our grocery stores now have plastic bags, not only in the fruit and vegetable section, but they also have it in the meat section as well. So I recommend that you grab one of those bags and open it up and put your hand in it. And then when you're at the store, 
grab that bag, grab that meat with the bag on your hand like a glove, and then pull that bag over that meat. And then put it either at the front of the cart away from the rest of your groceries or even underneath on the rack. That way, there's no chance of cross contamination even at the grocery store. You don't want to have any of those juices on any fresh fruits and vegetables that you may be taking home. And then last, and this is important when we talk about thawing, but you want to keep any of the meats separate from fruits and vegetables or anything else that it could drip on. So we always recommend that place meats in the refrigerator, that you do place it on a plate or in a tray, um, even like a nine by 13 pan, um, and place it on the bottom rack of your refrigerator. That way it doesn't have an opportunity to drip down on anything else. Okay, so thawing food safely. How do you all thaw your turkey? I'm interested in that. So if you put down in the comments below, let me know how you thaw your turkey. Because I know that a lot of people maybe will thaw it on the counter or thaw it in the refrigerator, or some people even try to cook their turkey frozen. So I'm curious, how do you thaw your food for Thanksgiving or even year round? A lot of us get in a hurry, maybe toss a pack of ground beef on the counter to thaw out. So let me know. We recommend three different ways to thaw your turkey for Thanksgiving. You can thaw it in the refrigerator, and that is always the safest route for any food thawing, is always to thaw it in the refrigerator. And again, if you choose to thaw it that way, we want you to put it in a pan or on a tray to collect any juices that may come out of that package while it's thawing. Then your other options are a cold water bath and a microwave, believe it or not, a microwave. So we're gonna talk about all of these here now. So thawing your turkey, a slow thawing in the refrigerator is always the safest way to do that. And so in our chart here at the top in table one, we recommend at least 24 hours for a four to five pound um, turkey. So if your turkey is 12 pounds, that's gonna be at least a three day thaw in the refrigerator. Now, once that turkey thaws in the refrigerator, it's safe in there for two days after it's thawed. So let's say you're unsure and you really wanna make sure that that turkey is thawed out before Thursday. If it was a 12 pound bird, you're safe to put it in the refrigerator Sunday, maybe even Saturday night, and then it should be thought out by Wednesday. That way it'll be safe to cook by Thursday. So you can keep it in the refrigerator thawed for up to two days and you should be okay. So the second way that you could thaw your turkey is the cold water bath method. And so the cold water bath is you would fill your sink with cold water and submerge the turkey in the package in that cold water. And you're gonna wanna change that water every 30 minutes. And it's gonna take about 30 minutes per pound of turkey. So again, for that same 12 pound bird, it's gonna take anywhere from six to eight hours um, to thaw out that turkey safely. Now, if you choose to do a cold water bath, you have to be able to cook that turkey immediately after it thaws. You don't want to wait two days to thaw or to cook that turkey. So this would be an option for you if you woke up early and wanted to start thawing your turkey on Thanksgiving Day and to cook it later on that evening. But you need to be able to prepare or, or to plan the cooking time as well. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. So you want to make sure um, the slow cook, thaw in the refrigerator is safest, and then you have the cold water method. And then I also mentioned microwaving thaw. Now that is only good for smaller turkeys up to 12 pounds. But what we recommend is you need to check the manufacturer's um, owner's manual to see uh, if it's safe for you to thaw your turkey that way and how long it is, because each manufacturer is gonna be different depending on the wattage of your microwave. But if you choose to thaw it in the microwave, you need to be able, again, to cook it immediately after thawing it out in the microwave. 
So safest bet for you all around is to thaw your um, turkey in the refrigerator. All right, so now we are moving on to cooking your turkey. So cooking your turkey, you have lots of different options. Oven roasting, cooking in a bag, um, using a roaster oven, deep, fret, deep fat frying, microwaving, and other methods like using a slow cooker or a pressure cooker. If you use those two methods, the pressure cooker, slow cooker, and even the microwaving, um, usually your turkey needs to kind of be disassembled for it all to fit properly in those devices. All right, so this is what I was talking about when we were talking about cooking times. So for turkeys roasting in the oven, the cooking time is usually dependent on the weight and size of the bird and if it's stuffed or unstuffed. So the times on table one here on, your, on our uh, slide is based on a 325 degree oven. So again, looking at that 12 pound turkey, your cooking time for that is gonna be anywhere from three hours to three and three quarter hours. So if you're thinking about the thawing time and say you woke up and decided you forgot to thaw out your turkey and you're doing that slow water or the cold water bath method, it could take about six to eight hours to thaw your turkey. And then if it's a 12 pound turkey, it's gonna take an additional three to three quarter hours to cook that turkey um, if it's unstuffed. If it's stuffed, it's gonna take almost four hours. So if you're, you know, if you're leaning more to that eight hour window of thawing, and then you're adding that four hours, there's a 12 hour window there that you need to make sure you've blocked off that amount of time when you've told your family what time you're serving dinner. Um, so that's something that you're going to want to um, keep in mind. So then the second time, uh, the second way of cooking is cooking in a bag. And you want to make sure that you're following the manufacturer recommended time on the oven bags. Generally, it's 350 degrees for that. Um, but the 12 hour bird, or the 12 pound bird, sorry, the 12 pound bird it's anywhere from two to two and a half hours on that. And so you can see it saves a little bit of time for that um, cooking in the oven bag and you don't have to worry about basting so that it doesn't dry out as you do with the roasting. Um, so those are some different options on those. Uh, there we go. So the other methods um, of cooking, again, it all depends on if it's stuffed or unstuffed and the time that it is. Um, so all cooking times on this area it, are estimates and you wanna always check the manufacturer's instructions, even on like a slow cooker or um, the deep fat frying. So I, I posted this on here um, just so you could see that the times are gonna vary and you wanna make sure that you're always following the manufacturer's instructions on those um, times and temperatures. So how do you tell when your turkey is done? A lot of times people will be waiting for that little pop-up timer if your turkey has one of those pop-up timers or they go based on uh, the skin color of the turkey, if it has that nice brown color, or they may um, just go by the temperature. Well, that's not always the safest way. We always want you to use a meat thermometer, not only at Thanksgiving, but we encourage meat thermometers at all times of cooking, especially when you're cooking your meat. So when, when you choose to cook your bird, you wanna remember that the final internal temperature needs to be 165 degrees. And you um, can check that on a turkey underneath the innermost part of the thigh and the innermost part of the wing. Um, and you wanna check it in the thickest part of the breast. And so when you check your, when you put the meat thermometer in, you wanna make sure not to hit any bone or hit any grizzle or anything like that, because you're not gonna be getting the accurate temperature, you're gonna be getting a higher temperature. And what you wanna do is you wanna take that turkey out of the oven and place it down on top of the stove 
and let the heat dissipate for just a minute or two before you check that temperature because you're gonna get the temperature of the heat from the oven if you check that temperature immediately. So anytime that heat can dissipate a little bit, it's better to um, then to check your temperature that way. Um, if you have stuffed your bird with stuffing, you also need to check the temperature of the stuffing by taking that thermometer and putting it internally into that stuffing. And the stuffing needs to be 165 degrees as well. So another thing you want to remember is you want to make sure that not only is that turkey at the right temperature, but we want to make sure that the rest of our side dishes are at their right temperature as well. So throughout our cooking, um, you want to make sure that you plan ahead so that all the dishes are kind of done at the same time. And if something gets done quicker than others, you want to make sure that we always are keeping hot foods hot and cold foods cold. So a way to do this is this is a great time for us to start utilizing any of those slow cookers, um, chafing dishes, or um, even our Instant Pots that a lot of people are using. They can be used as a way to keep foods warm. And if you are serving anything in a cold dish and it's gonna be out, you wanna make sure that you can put it in a dish that can sit down in another dish and that bottom dish has a nice ice bath, and that'll keep those foods cold. So we wanna make sure that um, if our party is gonna be extended, and let's say that you have part of your family coming at one time and another family coming at another, or you may just say, come anytime you can, the food will be sitting out and ready. Well, Technically, from the minute you take that food out of the oven and the minute that that food has um, been finished on the stove, your timer starts ticking and you only have a two hour window. That two hour window is our magic number for both buying at the grocery and getting that food back in the refrigerator for leftovers. So that's why it's important to keep hot foods hot and cold foods cold because the minute that our food starts cooling down, that's an opportunity for bacteria to start blooming again in our food. So um, chill our food quickly. So if um, your Thanksgiving dinner is finished, and let's say you still have a big pot of mashed potatoes left, you may want to put that in smaller dishes to help it cool quicker than putting it in one big bowl and putting it in the refrigerator. Because um, anytime that you got to think about when food gets cool, it cools from the outside in, but that also means that bacteria starts blooming from the outside in. So we want to make sure that you can separate that bigger dishes into smaller ones so that they can cool faster. Another thing you need to think about is your turkey. We recommend that you trim the meat off of your turkey and store it that way, except for the smaller pieces like your drumsticks, your wings, and your thighs. Those pieces can be stored on the bone, but the rest of your turkey, we recommend that you carve that and then store it in the refrigerator. And if you're not gonna be using that food anytime soon for leftovers, turkey meat can be frozen in freezer bags in the freezer and used for a later date. Uh, the refrigerator, you need to make sure that you're keeping it between 32 and 40 degrees. Uh, and then your freezer needs to be kept under 32 degrees uh, to keep all those foods at chilled at the right temperatures and frozen at the right temperatures. And then we also, and this is really important, especially this time of year when we will have a lot of leftovers and a lot of food, maybe even prior to Thanksgiving, just to, for prep when we go grocery shop shopping, we want to make sure that we don't overstuff our refrigerators and freezers. So if you glance in your refrigerator or freezer, you'll see either at the top or maybe on the sides, there are vents. And those vents need to be open so that air can circulate outside and or around the outsides of our food to keep those foods at the right temperature. So you wanna make sure not to overstuff those, um, that refrigerator or the freezer so that food has, or gosh, <laughs> air has that opportunity to circulate. Uh, let's see, I, I just talked about uh, storing our, our chick, oh gosh, our turkey. Uh, and 
one thing I didn't mention, you can keep those leftovers. You're usually your leftovers. And even this is general, just for all our foods in general, usually the window for using leftovers is three to five days. And on day five, I would either be eating it or pitching it in the trash. I would not be um, saving it for much longer after that. So what I want you to think about when you're storing any of your leftovers is, am I going to be eating this in the next three days? And if you're not, if it's something that you're not gonna be eating in the next three days, then I would take an opportunity to freeze it and save it for a later date so that you're not wasting food. Cause anytime you waste food, you're wasting your money that you've worked hard to earn. So think about that window first. Am I gonna be eating it in the next three days? And if you are, great, put it in the refrigerator and make sure that you use it. But if you're not, you do wanna store it. And then you've got that three to five day window to eat those leftovers in that refrigerator. When you do store things in the freezer, you always wanna make sure that you label it, especially with what date you put it in there. And then it's good for about six months in that freezer. So for those of you who may not have a meat thermometer at home, or if this lesson was really good and you really enjoyed it, we are making a food safety grab and go at the Cooperative Extension Office. We are located on the OCTC campus in the back of the campus at 4800A New Hartford Road. And we will have these grab and go kits available for you starting tomorrow morning. And in each kit, will be a meat thermometer. It's gonna look like this. And um, there's also information in there about food safety and lots of information about um, taking turkey and your sides. And then we also included some recipes. If you're somebody who maybe wants a lighter side of Thanksgiving, we've included a lot of our plated up Kentucky Proud recipes that are some uh, um, alternative options to your traditional Thanksgiving dishes. So I encourage you all to stop on by and pick up one of these um, grab and go kits. Food safety isn't always a topic that's like, woo, so excited, but it is a topic that we always need some more information about. And then I also put our phone number on here, which is 685-8480. If you ever have any questions or want some information sent to you, or even this slideshow sent to you, you can give me a call there and I'd be more than happy to share anything with you that we've talked about. Hey, Kelly. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you share the hours that uh, the you're open for people to come and pick up the grab and go kits? Well, our office hours are eight to 4.30 Monday through Friday. However, the grab and go kits are located out front in a tote. It'll say um, grab and go kits. And so even if you can't come while we're open, the kits will be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week out front. Um, you could also follow us on Facebook. We have a Davis County Cooperative Extension Facebook page. And then I have a Davis County Nutrition Education Program page. And we always post information like this on our, on our Facebook pages on both of them. So if you'd like to follow each one of those, that would be great as well. But the kits are available 24 hours a day out front in a plastic tote. So another source that you can utilize if you have questions about your turkey um, is the USDA meat and poultry hotline. They have a phone number that I put on here, 1888MP for meat and poultry, MP hotline or 674-6854, and they are available Eastern time, 10 to four, which is nine to three our time, Monday through Friday. But they also have an Ask Karen, which is their web-based automated service, and that's available 24 seven, even on Thanksgiving day. And then I know that some of our turkey manufacturers also have a hotline, for preparing the turkey on Thanksgiving day that they usually man and will answer those questions. So make sure to check your food labels on those turkeys that you buy and see if the brand has that. And that way you get to talk to a live person 
and um, get any recommendations. At the extension office as a resource or Katie Alexander. She is our family and consumer sciences agent. Either one of us are available to answer questions anytime you need it. You have our email addresses here on this slide. And then again, we have our phone number 685 8480. Please feel free to call and ask for Katie or Kelly if you have any questions or even want some more information. So, Lisa, does anyone else have any more questions before we wrap up for today? Uh, I think I asked all the questions that came in as they came in, but we did get a lot of comments thanking you and saying how great the information was. And I definitely think it's timely. So it was yes. very appreciated. Good. I'm glad. I'm. Gl this isn't usually a topic that people are are excited to hear about, but it. I mean, it's a it's a topic that. You can use this information all year long and it's stuff that even when I started working this job, there was some things I was like, huh, I didn't even know that. And to be honest, I didn't use a meat thermometer until um, I started working here. So about the last two years prior to that, I was kind of rolling the dice on whether my food, you know, if I cut it open and it wasn't pink, I thought it was finished, you know, and so uh I've learned a lot with with this job and and really food safety has become one of my favorite topics to teach people about. Well, Kelly, again, I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for sharing all that information. Um, before we go, I did want to announce that Diane Shock is our winner of the cutting board. Yay. Uh, Yay! So we will have that cutting board at the second floor information desk, Diane, and you can just come up there and give them your name and we'll be happy to give it to you. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I'm jealous. I want one of those. <laughs> it was a really nice cutting board. <laughs> I know. Well, Kelly, thank you for joining us again, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yes, and you all, everyone have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. You as well.